Hello, Jacob. Hello. So just off the heels of a successful, may I say, wildly successful Kickstarter, the yeah. Scourge of Northland. Yeah, uh, that was surprising. I wasn't expecting that. You weren't expecting to fund? <laughs> no, I wasn't expecting uh, that level of funding. Actually. So I didn't check your earlier Kickstarter. So I've got the tower. So I came by the, uh, the was it Tower of the Silver Axe? Yeah, Shadow of Tower of Silver Axe. The, the shadow of the tower of silver axe so i i ended up picking the pdf a, a while back so i was asking people about good examples of of uh, i think adventures or maybe i can't remember what it was and that was one of the two that they got recommended so i picked that up i think i missed you i'm not sure why i missed you was it valley of the manicor through the valley of the manicor through the valley of the manicor yeah, I just can't remember. Just got to be real short. I don't remember them. And uh, <laughs> and so I I kind of I, I missed that one, but I've been hearing about it. But I did. Uh, I was awake enough to to see your current Kickstarter. So I didn't compare the the funding levels to the different ones. So how how do they all compare? So the first one um, in the shadow of Tower Silver X was my first one, and that one I think we hit a little over twelve. That was where we ended which was surprising. Even then I was like, wow, I didn't expect to, to get that far. And then we hit um, 21,000 in um, Through the Valley of the Manicor. And then this last one ended a little bit over uh, 49. So that was a huge jump. <clears throat> yeah, I wasn't expecting that for it to get as high, but it was, it was great. You know, it's, it's now you can quit your job and retire. Absolutely. My wife has quit her job too. And now we're just in the indie games is how we're making a living. I see boxes of cash laying around. <laughs> it's uh it's been good. It it um it's encouraging for me to keep doing it, that's for sure. I, I, I do like doing this. I wouldn't say that I can only survive on this and nor should anybody have dreams that that may be exactly what you can do, but it's great. It's afforded me a lot of flexibility in my day job, which is illustration. I just do a lot of freelance illustration um, kind of mixed with this now. So it's, it's, I've definitely taken a step, step away from my former day job, which was um, freelance design work for private companies. Like I did a lot of um, website management and design for a real estate company, which, you know, was fine but not my not my bag <laughs> and and being able to step away from that and kind of do what i like doing is you know, it's been great well i guess as a freelancer it really it it can dovetail i'm assuming where you can you can turn on and off spigots of time a little bit more easily than somebody that's like locked into nine hour days yeah running away at the factory you, you got to be careful with that too because if you close yourself off from the market too long then people forget who you are but it's you know i guess if you've been in it long enough then you have your connections and your clients and you can be you could be sought again you could be reached out to yeah but, it's oh go ahead oh i was just gonna say but yes uh i guess when you establish yourself a little bit more then you can dovetail your time a bit more yeah, I mean, obviously, you don't want, you're right. You don't want to shut everything off, and uh, and um, but who knows? Maybe uh, you know it, it's it, it does seem that Kickstarter does start allowing people a little bit more opportunity to to, to kind of play in that space in a way it's that fantastic. Yeah, know. I couldn't imagine this sort of um, you know obviously this. I guess this fits into the gig economy. I guess you categorize that. Sure, way. it does. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, it's a different uh, style of um, career path, but I guess it, it works. It can work. Yeah, it beats mowing yards on the side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in Arkansas at this time. Especially in Arkansas, yeah. <laughs> I don't even like mowing my own lawn. No, I, I, I wonder, like, you know, I, I think it's probably back in the 50s. Somebody said, you know what, we need to dump fertilizer and, and weed control so our, all our lawns look perfect. That's a person I like to go back in time and punch in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, actually, we had a, because um, when we moved here from California, we had a push mower that was, we were to deal with that. So you had to like physically get it rolling in order to cut the grass. That's, I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> <No. Not fun. laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sure you, you, you're afforded a larger yard in Arkansas than you were in California. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think we, we, we could only rent. We were looking at buying in uh, California, but it was like, yeah, not going to happen, at least not yet. Yeah, it seems like to me, it's like you think, well, prices can't go any higher, can they? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> 10 years later, it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. It's the sad truth. Yeah, I don't think there's a ceiling. Okay. Yeah, I go out west and we visit some places in uh, in New Mexico and then, but especially in uh, Utah a few years ago. And I think they were upset. And I think this is probably even true up north, like the the Idaho's. But a lot of people from California just buying up land and space and moving out. You know, I guess out east for them. So sure, yeah, I I visited Salt Lake, yeah, not too long ago. It's it's quite hip there. I could see prices of property like getting up there. Yeah, not to go. Now I guess we're really going to rambling territory. Yeah, I've looked at the <laughs> land, <laughs> and uh, it's you, you can easily spend. It doesn't. It seems like you need to spend about two hundred thousand dollars or one hundred fifty thousand dollars for a plot of land, which is just insane. I'm assuming then. I wonder how you get water to it, but uh, yeah, it's definitely out of my price range. Yeah, absolutely. I guess buy that in a tent. I'm not sure the wife would go for that though. <laughs> so anyway, uh, back to, to more serious matters. Uh, so, so obviously you've got a, you got a series going here, or at least I don't say a series, but at least you have uh, a, a kind of a pathway going here. So, so how did the whole um, the shadow of the tower of silver axe start? Yeah. So I am the forever DM in my group, or I probably buy to be i'm always trying to get people together and get online or get together and play games so i'm always preparing stuff i'm like yes this new campaign is going to be amazing so i spent a lot of time doing that and when the pandemic hit we couldn't get our regular group together and i was trying to get an online group going and we couldn't seem to get that to work either um for whatever reason so i was like you know what um i heard about this zine quest thing coming up and i'm going to go ahead and put all this preparation work and try and make myself a module or something. And so that was my like pandemic project was uh, in the shadow of Tower of Silver X and <clears throat> sat down, wrote it, illustrated it myself. And uh, I actually had the cover for that one, um, which I had done back in 2017. So that was sitting on the cover art for a while. It's like, I really want to apply it to this one and submitted it and it worked out and people liked it. Uh, so that was kind of the beginning of that. Yeah, I mean, you definitely uh, you you may not have have gotten the the, the same level of, of sales, but it definitely uh, I think um, um, it, it's it I'm, I'm not sure the right word struck a nerve's not right, but you actually you know you you grabbed hold of something with that that resonated with people like it's like the right product the right time. Yeah, and I was part of the subreddit for the OSR, and you know everybody's really big on design and usability in that forum so you you learn a lot or you at least gauge a lot of what people are into and i went to school for design so like i'm always thinking about layout and usability readability is really huge and <clears throat> i wanted to try and make sure that i could fit the whole dungeon adventure location like in one spread so you wouldn't have to flip that was one big thing that was that gavin norman did for you know like the dolman wood stuff the Winter's Daughter and uh, some other creators kind of got close, like uh, Jacob Hurst. His, his layouts really inspired my uh, layouts too, using um, readable fonts and having everything really well organized on the page. I uh, felt like it was really important. But I wanted to simplify the maps a little bit even further. Instead of like the hand drawn maps, I wanted to make it just uh, like vector images so that it's very readable, very presentable. Yeah, definitely high contrast with the with the exactly. black background with the white. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it does stand out. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think the thing too is, I mean, it's it's a pretty good uh, system because you know the way you, it, it, you're not you don't have the full space like you would with a normal eight and a half by eleven, no. or I guess a four. So you, with that a five or is it a five? It's or close to a five. Yeah. 
Or are you just doing this the normal like eight and a half by was that five and a half by eight, eight, and, and, half half? By eight and a half? Yeah. Yeah, that's like the um American version of the A5, basically. Yeah. So I, I guess the question is so I stood at the crossroads. So you did you stand at the crossroads and try to make a decision whether you're gonna go eight five, a five or uh eight and a half by five and a half digest size? Uh I did for a little bit, but then when I saw that it was for Zine Quest, there they had the specific uh, requirements that it fit this like eight and a half by five and a half size booklet that was soft or staple saddle stitched was like the they didn't I, don't, I think they said specifically saddle stitch or maybe it was like could be saddle stitch unbound no hardcover was like their yeah it was supposed to be saddle stitched um yeah traditionally and that was i was like all right well i need to make it fit in this so but, I wanna... but you're the only few people that actually follow the rules to the t and, it, and the rules are kind of going by the wayside now too. So now, now it's not a requirement. I think that it, before it was like, I it was you know required or at least um, it would have been uh, encouraged. I would I would say that it was black and white interiors or black and white art, but I didn't I didn't strict, uh, strictly stay to black and white either. So yeah, the. My latest one, uh, Gary's Appendix, I, I I just decided this is, I'm going to brand this OSC where uh, I think yours does, yours does have, does yours have the, uh, the OSC logo on it, like compatible? Yeah, yeah. I started with them and kind of stuck with it. I, but I didn't, I mean, it's, it's smart for you since you've started, you don't want to, if you're, if you're doing a series of things, it would, you drive collectors completely nuts if two of them were one size or the other. People would be angry at you for the rest of their lives. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm starting to, I, I, there's some people that are a little vocal in the audience where I'm like, I'm changing the art up in almost every book. I, I do, like, I did a lot of like hand drawn illustrations all in black and white in the first book. And then I started doing like digital painting and then I was experimenting with the AI art. <clears throat> Uh -oh. in, this, in this latest one um but um, again i'm going to change it up in the next one i'm going to go straight back to all hand drawn illustrations so it's i i just can't be <laughs> i can't keep everything uniform otherwise it'll, it, uh, it'll make you crazy <laughs> yeah I don't, I, I I don't like to put too many restrictions on myself though i am keeping the layout somewhat similar and obviously i'm not going to switch out of osc at this point so well i mean I, with osc you know, technically, um, it, you know, I, I can't necessarily speak for even 5e, but in general, it works for everything. Absolutely. It, That's yeah. Too. Yeah. It, it's, it, you can easily convert it. It's not, it's not difficult at all. It's a good starting point if you want to use any other game. Yeah. And I think even 5e, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert of 5e, but it probably wasn't that much of a, of a, of a stretch to, to just throw in the new monster or, you know, stat box and such, but yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely, it, it's a good solid system that just seems to, like, like we mentioned, just works for all the other OSRs without, you know, and that's where I was kind of thinking too, did, were you contemplating like just branding it OSR? Originally, no, because I, I, at the time I loved uh, um, Old School Essentials. I was a huge fanboy, so I was like, I want to make it for old school essentials. And it was pretty much on that. I was contemplating making it. Yeah, I guess I was vacillating for a moment on just making it for BX, you know. But nobody does that. I was like, why not just do it for OSC? But now it's very popular, so it'd be it wouldn't make any sense not to. Yeah, I, I figured because I think people do. It's a lot of times buy into like if you're in a, into labyrinth lord or whatever the the flavor is I'm, I'm sure you you seek those things out sure yeah but i i think probably in general um the difference i don't think people like playing these other ones are going to probably be likely to reject it because it is osc versus so i i think from a business standpoint i i think that the the, the benefit versus risk there's more people enjoying OSE, so there's more likely to catch their eye than people on the offs to, to say maybe reject it because it's not what you know the, their particular brand. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's um, people will find the system and then, you know, search out, oh, there's other adventures that are like kind of built around this system. So yeah, it makes total sense. Um, what what is your like go to system if it's not OSC? Um, I generally like um, I really like a lot of different systems. So I mean, not, I'm not I'm not in any way really um, in like stuck with one system. Like I enjoy like I've enjoyed running Cipher system. Uh, I haven't I have not tried that or read anything about it so i know no, i've heard it just recently so I'm, I'm just kind of learning about it now it's a little bit wonky as far as uh kind of how i approach things but it's, it's it's a very quick resolution system it's very fun it's very um it uses a d20 that everybody can comprehend the generally what the way it works is you have a um you have a um <clears throat> like a target number mm -hmm. so whatever that target number is you multiply by three and that's what you have to roll I think it, it's been a while. Either you have to roll lower than that on your uh, on your no above that. Um, yeah, you have to roll that above it. So if you if there's a target level of three or one, uh, you'd have to roll a three or better to succeed. Gotcha. Okay. And then what will happen is it goes from like one to ten, and then your skills and different things you can adjust that level. Hmm, okay. And then you just multiply by three. So it's it's pretty quick as far as it resolves. And, and the characters have uh, um, XP, um, which they can can spend to to modify things. It's 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 just a very it's very different, but it's also once you learn it's pretty quick. Yeah. But and that and Cortex, enjoy Cortex. I enjoyed um I enjoy the um um can't believe uh, the um yeah, I'm brain fog. The uh, um, <laughs> uh, Forbidden Lands, uh, uh, oh, yeah. Coriolis uh, Free League. Yeah, I enjoy yeah. that. I, I think I just I enjoy different game systems uh, because they'll produce different types of feel. Sure. Yeah, and that's uh, I've got a lot on my list of things I'd love to try, and I've been for it feels like for years I've been trying to get a game of Mothership in, and I cannot for the life of me get my friends nailed down in, uh, in, in schedule time so so mostly it's been uh, OSE a little bit of swords and wizardry um, and kind of stuff that's very similar a little bit of OD and I think we I convinced my friends to try that out with chainmail that was a uh, I think it was an, an interesting experiment but uh, <laughs> not a system I'd want to go back to. I, I think we all have those where it's like it's it's nice to have played it you, like <clears throat> I played chainmail once Mm -hmm. and uh at a convention it was fun but i mean it was definitely it was it was i mean obviously not a, a rpg but you play it and you're like okay i'm glad i played it yeah exactly. <laughs> got that out of my system now. yeah it's just like you know you can mark it out on the box and and then it's kind of fun because i mean it really you know different different games at different time periods they are kind of snapshots in time of of the progression of of the games that we enjoy now Totally. Yeah, Chainmail is definitely one of those. It feels a lot like the precursor to the modern commercial war game, you know, in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's, um, and I've not played Mothership um, at all. So, but I do have some stuff from Mothership. I bought, I think, a couple of zines. Yeah, yeah, I have a small collection growing now, too. Cool layout. <laughs> just Man, just taunting you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I've got a box of like a whole bunch of systems. And then another one that uh, I just picked up recently, let's see if I can find it, uh, which is another game system I want to try, Primal Quest. Oh, yeah. Diego Naguero. Naguero. Yeah, I can't pronounce his name, but. Yeah, he told me how to pronounce it. I, I actually interviewed him a couple of times, at, yeah. and I, I'm not going to try it. Beautiful design, and I love the concept. I'd love to try that game. Yeah. So many, especially when <laughs> all these great creators are putting out games every year during Zine Quest and you back up like 20 games and it's like, I'm never going to get the chance to play this. Yeah, it, it is hard. Uh, one thing I'm threatening to do is, is, I don't know if you've heard of Rune Quest. It's, it's a fairly old game that's yeah. continuing, but I'm, I'm going to try and run a game of that in the, in that's the future. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe get two people. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's it. <laughs> Can't handle more than that because it's going to take us a long time to roll everything. Yeah. Oh, is it one of those kind of complex yeah, it's, character it, creations? Yeah, well, the character creation is pretty extensive, and um, in in general, it's kind of like before combat. You there's a lot of spells and things you can do, so there's you got some decisions to make and try and buff up. So if you just go into combat, you're you're going to lose limbs. It's it's one of those kinds of games. It's so it's it's kind of deadly, but it's you got to just check out. You get a chance to check out Rune Quest. It's so yeah. the guy who did it. Um, it is very much a uh, high. I call it'd be very much high fantasy, mm -hmm. but it's Bronze Age, and it's it's very much tied to um, like um, like a pantheon and pagans. It's not like it's it, it is like magic is in the world in a way, not like D and D, and it's not like it'd be like imagining if like what the Celts believed and what the Picts believed and what the maybe the American Indians believe not necessarily in particular, but all these things, that kind of world was real. Hmm. Interesting. And, oh yeah, it is. It that is. Uh, real cool. I, I've seen, I haven't read anything about the rules, but the cover art for those books, stellar. So that's always been, that's always a big selling point for me is cover. <laughs> yeah. The, the problem is, 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 is it's just very, it's a very dense uh, setting. So it's just sure. trying to, you know, <laughs> penetrate into that denseness. <laughs> yeah. that's interesting yeah so if, going back to your uh you know your zines especially for the um you know at least what i noticed for the uh um the shadow of the tower of of um silver axe was the the use of the topographical maps mm -hmm. yeah that was a um a challenge that i kind of wanted to set on myself i hadn't seen anybody else do it and i was like maybe that'd be interesting to do and you know i just set out to started making it in illustrator and it took freaking forever for the first one the first one took a long time because i was originally i had started with a map that was easily six times larger and i had to settle on a just a corner of the map <laughs> i was like okay this map is it's way too big to fit into one adventure i'm going to just take this little section and we'll make an adventure around this um and yeah it was <laughs> it was very time consuming making that topographical map but it turned out it turned out well, and um, it seems like uh, it's a staple now. People really expect that. Really... <laughs> it's a curse now. Huh? <laughs> well, yeah, and it's not how I run my games. I like yeah. making the maps, um, but I don't make a I don't make a player's version of the map. I don't like to show the map to the players. However, in that in all of my books now, I, I have a player's version of the map that seems like people like, and they say they use. So I I, I believe them. Well, I think it, for one is. If I were a betting man, I would have bet you went to whatever government website and just picked up something from some survey and used that. So I had no idea that you handcrafted that. Well, I did it in Illustrator with a bunch of layers. Um, and I, I have trail maps from like my hiking days when I was able to do that for before kid. Um, and I would reference that and kind of like, all right, I need to make it do elevation markers and kind of draw this out but i initially did it using um the photoshop like cloud filter to like get these mounds and then i would make it kind of random and then from there i would like erase things and move things around and so the just... cloud kind of gave you the the organic mm -hmm. rather than yeah. something that's been predetermined I like, exactly i like drawing from like very non-specific and then after the random results have influenced me then i'll take that in a direction and then then i can kind of steer things in the direction that i want them to go so how many layers did you have in illustrator uh it's a lot because <laughs> you have to everyone's yeah you have to have all the contour lines on a separate layer and all of the um, the shading and all of the labels and all of the elevation labels and all that stuff has got to be on a separate layer yeah, it gets it gets a little tedious. The first one took a long time, but now I've got a system and a workflow down. So now the the topographic maps don't take me quite as long, and I don't need to start with like a random like cloud um, generator layout. I can like hand draw the map and kind of like sketch it out to get an idea, and then I can put in the contour lines, starting with like the highest peaks or the lowest points, and kind of build around that. So uh, to me, it take a lot. Of 
it seemed like there'd be a lot of zhuzhing around of each one of those ovalities, yeah. whatever. Yeah, there's a lot of moving that around. Yeah, using the pen tool to make all the contour lines. Um, but that's like where I want to start with all of these adventures because I don't know necessarily what the story is about yet because I, I think starting with the geography influences, you know, who lives there or what you, dungeons you might find and where they might be placed or bodies. Well, that's funny because it, it, there's no one right way. But it's, There it's, is no one right way. But yeah. Travis Miller, who is on the podcast, great guy, uh, his premise is it's the opposite. Don't even don't even bother to a map till after you've gotten everything kind of written down. Interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting approach. Yeah, I like doing the map just because it's it's kind of like drawing, like where you're starting with something that's non-specific and then you get more specific. Right. I have like just the 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 latest one was the Northland, and you know I've I've got this step with mountains and hills and lakes and stuff, and I'll put the orcs over here or the giant spiders layer over here and kind of just go from that yeah and i think the thing i think there's a lot of ways of looking at it too because in some ways you know as you are going through the process of creating the the we'll just call the map the art you know the art of the map is can in a sense be inspirational as you're doing it so it can inform you as you are drawing it to like oh wow this is this is a cool thing here mm -hmm. i need to put something here yeah, you know, or some along those lines. I'll do that too with uh, illustration. Sometimes I'll illust do an illustration before I'll have written like the dungeon. So I have, I just feel like drawing like a spider or something like that. And I did that with Silverax. So I had some illustrations done before I had created the adventure in like the premise. You know, I've, I've ran um, some games. So I ran a kind of a, like a Blades in the Dark game. And what I would do is, and it's a great game if you're wanting, it, it, it's just, a, you can do like every night, you can just do a different scenario and you don't need to do much planning at all. It's another but, one of my list, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, so uh, I would, but what you can do is I would kind of have a scene in my mind. So I want this scene. And then you just think backwards, like how can I create that scene? So you could draw that spider and and show this, you're like, okay, this is going to be in there. Now mm -hmm. that I've, I've established this scene, this explanation, what the players see, what they're going to experience. Now I can work outward from that, that particular to, uh, or to, you know, to, to everything else. Yeah. Yeah. And I kind of was doing that with this latest one too. Um, bef before um, I wrote or started working on this adventure, I was reading OD and D books and chain mail and trying to like see how those worked together. And it, yeah, it's, it took a lot of time to kind of like get close to being able to run a session. And after I started running sessions and begin starting to think about how mass combat was going to work in that system, in that space, I was like, well, it'd be kind of cool if that could work in just a module. Cause you don't really see that in, or at least I haven't come across modules that like, make it so that mass combat, at least on a like skirmish or small-ish level can happen. It's mostly just like whatever happens in the dungeon or some encounters that happen over overland. <clears throat> I wanted to kind of have like the backdrop of a war going on and kind of have the possibility of um, like larger combat encounters occur. So yeah, I was just kind of inspired by reading the chain mail books and kind of like that working backwards and trying to figure out how I might be able to incorporate that. Yeah, because you're right, because it, it went from larger combat to just uh, to dungeon delving mm -hmm. uh, probably pretty quickly. Yes, and I and I read a lot of that where it was like everybody was like, we're done with the mass combat thing. We are just in the dungeon, <laughs> even though the earlier old timers were that was what they were all about, which is cool. I love that too. Uh, but I would just I think it's fascinating where the roots have come from where, where we are now. Yeah, um, and I don't know that anything really does um, like mass. I think it's just I think it's, it's kind of even going back to like battle tech. It's like you can you can play the battle tech as the the mech game, but I don't think the playing the characters really works well from what I've heard. And it's just like you're trying to do two things at once, and it doesn't really work well. And I think it's probably similar here. I don't know that there's really 
as D&D has advanced, there really has been like reasonably quick and easy mass combat rules. No, and, I, and I'm and i still searching. I'm probably not going to be um, like incorporate, or maybe I think we've talked about, my editor and I've talked about incorporating like some very simplified, but it'd be very abstracted combat. You know, I've, I've seen other suggestions online from like YouTubers with their, um, you know, boiling the whole combat down into just a couple scenes and roles, um, which, I think is fine in practice. I've still never had a chance to run run that because I don't want to force my players to get into that situation. It just never came up. But yeah, I almost wonder. And that's going to sound crazy. Now we're saying that. I wonder it would be interesting is if there could be like some sort of bluffing card game that would be a um, a means of determining outcomes. <laughs> I have not thought about that. That that is really interesting. And then maybe you get certain, or maybe you get certain cards too, based on certain things. Like, I don't know. That's interesting. Now you got me, my wheels turning. The, like the last game we played, I think my friends and I was bullshit. So yeah, the bluffing poker card game. That was war, or just like pairs, basically. Because that kind of would be like war. Is like, are you going to put it all forward? Or are you going to just, you know, small skirmishes and. Mm -hmm. and uh, wait over time um you know those types of things i don't know yeah i i have no idea how to make it like to move tr to transition cleanly from like we're playing the role-playing game to we're playing this combat encounter the other one would be uh might just be as simple as just a bunch of dice and each dice representing you know a a a, a group or a unit and then may have been different size and then you just all you're doing is it's <laughs> you're jumping handfuls of dice handfuls of <laughs> yeah. dice, and canceling things out yeah exactly i mean that's that's basically how chain mail works in in a nutshell yeah i just uh i think i never played battle system that was i think supposed to that was i think second edition days i don't know if that not, i haven't that read that one i have um Swords and spells, or whatever one was that came shortly after um, ODD, but that's not a very good system either. I don't know. I wonder if um, if Pendragon, or as I think uh, Jeff Richard called it, Pendagon, uh, if that's got any, because that, that's when you play. Uh, it's an Arthurian style. Oh yeah. Game. Yeah, I love that aesthetic. That's really cool. That'd be interesting to look at that. Yeah, and that's a game where you you don't necessarily just play a character. You play the family lineage. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and your character, you know, if it is not battle, will die of old age, but you'll end up playing the descendants. And so it's kind of a longer tale that's that's spanning, you know, two generations. That's fascinating. Um, that reminds me of... Um, I don't remember the author, the creators, but um, Kingdoms and Microscope, his games, where it's yeah. a story game that you play out. Ben Robbins. Ben Robbins, yeah. Yeah, the creator of West Marches, or at least yeah. making it popular. Yeah, he's a, those are those are games also on my list I haven't had a chance to play, but I've heard of people, or at least suggested, I think Matt Colville on his channel suggested using those as like a, a beginning of a campaign, like building your setting using those yeah i did microscope once it was <laughs> it was like with a it, it's like a professor of physics uh, as an older guy and nobody else showed up and it was like <laughs> eight at night and we ended up playing out of king con and it was it if you if you get the right people it, it could be a very entertaining time you, you, I think you kind of is it, it, it definitely lends itself for um, if you try and keep out of going into always the tropes, you can wind up some probably some very interesting things with the right group of people. But I see it, it really pays to have probably four or five people doing it, not just right. one or two. Bouncing ideas, different ideas. Yeah, because they can they can basically create. Uh, help create those uh, twists you know we all well we all but it's very easy for me to think along a certain line just good to have somebody else break that line and somebody else break their line and otherwise we just it's easy just to fall into um, 
at least for me, it is the same old patterns. Right. Making Lord of the Rings or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's kind of like I remember writing them. I, I, I thought it was very clever about this mystery. And and then it's like they the player solved it like instantly. And I'm like, I guess I really am not that, not that clever. <laughs> well, good on them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely uh, opportunities as far as that goes. Um, but anyways, and going back to, not to keep going back, but go back to the topographical maps because that, that, oh, yeah. that I find fascinating. So other people have used elevations before. I think other people have done maps that they kind of demonstrate different elevations, but it, I think by you doing, it's kind of interesting, you choosing what you did, you, you kind of, in some ways, I think broke the feeling of it being, like, it kind of goes against the the grain of, like, a fantasy game, because mm -hmm. it's very much looks like it. But I think on the other hand, it also very clearly lays out what the topography is in a way that is pretty easy to understand for a GM to have characters moving around in that. Yeah, I've uh, I've heard from some um, users or people who have played that they said it's it's lend lend them um, better to their path crawl game where they they take the trails and they are using the elevation and the geographical like markers uh, to describe what the what the players are seeing, which is really cool because that I, that was something that I had looked at. Um, somebody talked about on their blog and I will for, I won't remember the name of the author um, but what he described in his um, blog post was that it was like a path crawl I think it was what like he was he was advocating for path crawls over point crawls or uh, <laughs> now crawl. we're getting obscure so how is exactly. a path crawl different than a point crawl he would use like different things can be paths like you he you um find a game trail and that's now a path or you hear a river over that way the sound of the river is a path and basically using this um the descriptions of what the players sense as w things that can draw them in different directions so they can if they're going on a game trail and they they find like a uh, I don't know, an unused road or something like that, then suddenly they have a branching path and they can decide to keep on going this way or keep on going this way. And then the map will kind of dictate how long it takes them to get there. Okay. Instead so of using like a hex, whereas, which yes. I like, yeah. So if you, if you seen Ultraviolet Grasslands? I've seen it. It is a beautiful looking book. I have not read it myself. Okay, so it's definitely a, a very much a point crawl Mm -hmm. but it has i think around the cities generally if i recall correctly like some different odds and ends so it's similar to that but i can see where there is, is definitely it's you know um look at very clearly i mean the points are very clear on the map this is a point crawl yeah. gotcha but okay. but i can definitely see how you are you're still creating these are the points but you're just allowing more possibilities without the intention that those have to be found like those are not right. important to the story right 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 and i think that it's um what i'm what i've definitely laid out um unequivocally like i've definitely laid out the topography and the geography of this area but everything within that you know dms can do whatever they want you know i've given them NPCs and creatures and tables, but like different things can happen within that space. The only thing that I've, and I've seen people adjust the maps to their own taste too. Obviously you can do whatever you want, but I, I like I like having a, a grounded location or environment that the adventures can take place in, but everything within that can change per table. You know, different groups can experience different things. And one thing I've thought about wondering like for travel games uh made more especially is in kind of going back, back to like lord of the rings there is like maybe the maybe the quickest path from point a to point b is the most difficult one mm -hmm. like through a mountain range right yeah but or and maybe there's even a better one where you uh you, you need to find the hidden paths or you can choose the long route, but maybe that has a different set of difficulties or maybe there's a time crunch. And I've never really thought of a way that I could make it work where players would have to make a decision 
and based on and they would choose different paths based on what they're willing to risk and mm -hmm. um you know and those types of things that's to me kind of seems like it'd be but i'm not sure i've ever seen a game really do that no i haven't uh run anything like that either but i a dm that i had was a player in that group they, he kind of tried to present certain choices you know as it were but i think quickly we just were like oh we're going to take the easiest path we just were <laughs> the, the, the one where we're risking the least um regardless of how long it takes because players are risk averse it is funny yeah <laughs> which, is, which is you know something that the osr tries to promote but i think we were playing um i forget the name of the system it was like a it was a d6 system i can't remember what it was called it was pretty simple. I think we ended up switching over to fifth edition though. Um, so was it fantasy age? It was fantasy age. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was fantasy age and it was like his homebrew bronze age, like sword and sandal sort of um, setting kind of Conan-esque. Yeah. Yeah. I find it strange because I ran some games for some kids that are fairly new to the whole thing. And, and I, and I, it, it is interesting how some, some of the kids, were like so very risk like from day like from you know hour one like the risk aversion <laughs> to something that's just nothing but scratches a pencil on paper <laughs> yeah and you know I, I found that when i'm like play testing my current adventures like yeah my players were like well i'm not going to touch that shit because <laughs> i'm obviously going to explode so you know yeah you kind of have to I don't know. I don't know how you. I don't know. I don't know how you get around that. I don't, it's, um... Yeah, I think. I, I think some people are just natural that way, mm -hmm. and you know, like I ran a traveler game, and they got a ship, and you know, and the guy who was piloting would not would not do anything that would endanger that ship. <laughs> you want to explore that plant? I will drop you. He was perfectly fine spending the game session in orbit but wow. keeping the ship clean <laughs> and be on an acidic planet that could start corroding his hull yeah he's like i don't want to get rid of my imaginary ship <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i think the i think it's, it's a good question about, about risk aversion i think some people are naturally that way but i think the other thing is there needs to be a way of rewarding players for taking risks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And maybe give them a little bit of a carrot and ensure them that you're not going to lose your ship in the acidic cloud. You know, you can, for an hour, you can. Well, you know, he wouldn't hang on for that. <laughs> yeah, he wouldn't even, wouldn't even try. I think for some games, like for instance, have you ever played Savage Worlds? Yes. So you can get these bennies. And then you can do rerolls of those bennies. And that does reward. I got a handful of bennies. Let's just do it. <laughs> yeah. But also, I've seen where it didn't really matter because they still felt every single roll. Right. Because yeah. <laughs> so they're burning after benny after benny. But That's I think, funny. I think, I think some mechanics, I think some rules, they do promote more risk taking if you know that you have the opportunity to maybe reroll a, a few times yeah and i think um story games they might be a little bit um more lenient and i haven't tried dungeon world um it's another one where i was i wanted to kind of see what it was like but i think you can take more risks in those and there could be like a little bit of well it's you the risks it's the, the 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 beauty of it and the danger of it is really all the risks is really at the hand of of the dm it yeah. is much less of you're the one as a gm you're the one that determines the result of a of a failed role right so i think it's a good i think everybody should run a uh, dungeon world like everybody should run at least once you know at, like mobile games i think there's a lot to learn from from it but but um yeah, yeah i'm think, not sure go ahead oh i was just gonna say yeah my my um hesitancy for running that is like yeah it feels like there's a lot of onus on the dm to be extremely creative like right now <laughs> it feels like i would be absolutely burnt out and exhausted by the end of a session 
Yeah, the, the what's what's it it's the so the the partial success, the seven through nine, those aren't too bad. That's where you can offer, you know, a you know, them a, a choice or you know, or you can be a, a complication or whatever. But what's really hard is the fail. And that's where you're supposed to do a move. And that move can be from a soft move to maybe you're moving some sort of clock forward. Right. Or it could be something environmental, or you could just do some sort of hazard, or you could cause damage. Right. And so that's the hard part that puts a lot of cognitive load on the, you know, on the, on the GM. Right. And you have to make that decision and not feel like you're either, you know, coddling the players or punishing them too much. Right. Right. And, um, but again, I think there is value in it, but yeah, I think those do. Um, I'm trying to think of other ways you can reduce risk or that risk, but maybe more, more. I think the other thing too is, um, you know, a lot of times people also poo poo, um, like they're, they're very much in, in favor of like, um, you know, the dice are what they are and it's character death. But I mean, the other thing could be is, you know, maybe maybe the, the the result isn't that characters die. Maybe the result is they're captured. Yeah, you know, or something along those lines. Yeah, that was another thing that we were talking about too, because I was speculating on the the new one D and D or the the next edition, and I was hoping that something like that would come out, or like it, some built in like story mechanics or something that can progress the the game in a different direction other than just you know slogging combat back and forth you know it can maybe be a huge shift and maybe there's mechanics that will like allow for them to be captured that'd be really cool you know if that could just be a result that can happen or something yeah i i don't think you're gonna see i don't think i don't think you're seeing any huge shifts probably not no no <laughs> one can dream but i uh it, it is something that is lacking yeah, and I know some people have done um, have done um, listen to I think Jason Hobbs' uh, podcast. I think he talks about you know the, the critical uh, damage they'll do instead of death. Mm -hmm. um, Dungeon World um, has a thing where when you die, you roll, and mm -hmm. some really weird stuff can happen out of it. <laughs> and so you know death may not be yeah you may end up coming back but you may be a little different after it's all said and done right yeah i've read the or read that book and it's and it seemed to be really interesting where they handle the death mechanics not too dissimilar from well i'd say i say not too dissimilar from fifth edition but i think it's when that like you won't die as often in dungeon world as you would like an OSR game, probably on same on par with fifth edition. I don't, I've never lost a character in fifth edition, and I've never witnessed another character die either. So I don't, yeah, I've seen it, I might have seen it a few times, but in general, it's, it's, it, well, I guess that's just, I guess that's what's interesting. So that is a, I will say that is a game that makes, okay, that game does make people less risk observe, uh, uh, um, averse. Yeah. Totally. And I, and I, and I see it both ways where like, yeah, it's, if you don't, if the risk of death isn't around the corner all the time, then players are going to try stuff more that are, that's more risky. So, but how do you, how do you balance that? Yeah. And I think I thought too, it's like, you know, what if, what if at first level, you know, maybe different character classes, you get like a guaranteed success. Sure. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a card. You can hand everybody a card. Mm -hmm. You can only and, and maybe maybe it refreshes every game, or maybe it refreshes every session, or whatever. Maybe you go up another level, you get another one. And it, that in itself may not actually be detrimental to the game because it doesn't guarantee that they're doing maximum damage or anything like that. But it does kind of provide some more uh, opportunities to be heroic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know they can. I mean, look. So in your in this system, would you be able to play that after a dice result, or like in lieu of like oh, I failed, can I play my card, or would you choose to play the card before? The I think I to me the problem is is when you when you make people uh, roll. Bef 
I think people are less like, I think to me, it's better if you, that's a good question. I think I, I would not have them roll. Yeah. Because I, I, people are going to feel I, bad no matter what they roll. Well, I mean, it bad. If they were to roll, right. No, I would actually would use it. The reason I would use it without them rolling is because it would feel heroic. Yeah, exactly. Where it would be like, oh, I got a gimme because I missed my roll. Yeah. I've got a player at my table who would totally be like, what well, can I roll first and then see? <laughs> would well, I in. think to me, like with inspiration, the way sure. fifth edition is, that makes sense because that's just, a, I think it's crappy the way it's set up. It is, yeah. And, um, but I think where if you're guaranteed a success and then I think it, that would feel more heroic. The other thing I was thinking about too, is along the lines with poison <clears throat> is, uh, so like, so to me, what's odd about poison is poison is a, it's no different than a sword. It's no different than a fireball. Uh, you roll versus poison or you die. Blah. Right. Yeah. But what if you get poisoned and then you, um, but the result is you're still going to die, but you're not going to die till the end of the session that night. Mm-hmm. And you can still act as your character, but now right. you're acting away knowing you're going to die and you're going to make it count. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, kind of like a suicide squad. Sort yeah. Of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're like, well, I've, I've got nothing to lose now. So, yeah. Exactly. The other thing I thought, too, is if somebody on the summer lines, let's say somebody dies in the middle of battle, like they go below zero, you know, maybe you could say that was a mortal wound and you're still going to die. Uh, but you can survive one more hit in this battle, mm-hmm. go, or whatever it may be. And it still allows them to, they still suffer the, 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 they still suffer the penalty of receiving a mortal wound. It's just, it's forestalled and they're able to act heroic. Yeah, totally like the Boromir scene. Yes, like, yes, and, yes, yeah. yes. You have one last like <laughs> badass moment. But, yeah, I love having that sort of stuff happen. It rarely happens um, whenever there's a character that dies in like OSC game. It's just like, oh, it was a wolf that you guys got <laughs> attacked by in the middle of the night <laughs> for the first night. That was what happened to one of the players and it feels kind of lackluster. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it is kind of strange. It, it is hard to, yeah, and I'm not sure why there isn't, it doesn't seem like there's really has been much development of any mechanics along those lines. It seems to be either keeping things pretty pretty straightforward and deadly or the other side where it's like, <clears throat> this as long as that the cleric can keep doing that cantrip, you can keep falling down. It's just, it's like, yeah, I know. I get why certain DMs have banned the cleric in their game, but you know, there's, there's, there's got to be a balance. I like this idea. I like this. Um, mortal wound last um action sort of uh, mechanic well and it would be interesting too is if you were to uh, to dial that maybe by class and maybe by you know even subgenre you know sure yeah it would have to be but definitely like the heat that the fighters get the you know last like sword swing or whatever yeah, maybe Clara gets a curse. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> I like that too. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's just, uh, and I guess it's kind of interesting. I'm not sure how, I don't do much reading anymore. I wonder how the genres normally handle that. Like in fiction? Like in- yeah, yeah. I haven't really thought along those lines. I mean, you know, obviously the the the, the Boromir, but I mean, other ways they handle people dying and what that means, right? And, been... Yeah, and I don't, I haven't read too many books where they have healing. You know, that doesn't really come up in a lot of the fantasy fiction that I've read. So. No, it's like cell phones in horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> it don't exist. Yeah, yeah. would defeat all of the drama. They wouldn't. Be yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Call nine one one. Right. Yeah, and I think too, it's like right, and, and there is no yeah. For most, it's it's kind of interesting because the you know the um, the genre is turned into you know a war game turned into a fantasy game rather than literature turned into a role playing game, and so 
um, not where I was going with this. <laughs> it took too long with the setup. It's getting too late. Uh, I, I, I see where, yeah, I see where there's some, you know, lacking. It feels too tactical and, you know. Yeah, like the cleric, like they're just a magic user totally. with cherry mail and a, and a mace. Like, yeah, it's essentially the same thing, but he just does, I don't know, divine magic. It's the same thing. You're right. Yeah, so nobody nobody thinks twice, but maybe you know there should be a cost for healing. There should be a cost for healing. Yeah, um, maybe for the person who's being healed. Right. I mean, the person's like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready to sign up for for your religion yet, or whatever it may be. I don't know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, it won't work unless you're a follower. You're devout. Yeah, or maybe you lose part of your soul. You only have so many parts of your soul has gone before you know you're whatever i don't know maybe your will's completely gone at that point i don't know but it seems like there's a plenty of opportunities to to keep the the cleric um powerful but yet also just making it so that people are less likely to use that always as their choice i like that like maybe it's sort of deleting their soul and it's moving them further into the afterlife you know, yeah and then they're like after 10 times or eight times and you're no longer part of this world you're now ethereal oh, that's a cool idea and maybe depending on your deity so maybe you have a nature deity become more feral or maybe you start becoming more just uh you know losing your humanity or mm -hmm. or maybe if you're if you're more of a if a more enlightened religion maybe you start becoming pacifistic <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's fantastic <laughs> Oh, that's so good. Yeah, so the barbarian decides to to go home and grow a garden and <laughs> be a cheese maker. Right. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, it's uh so anyway, you've got three of these down. Are you are you on a roll? Are you gonna keep going with this? Or are you going to, yeah, to branch yeah. off to different things? Or what's um, the thoughts? Well, eventually uh I'd like to do something like science fiction and adventure for a sci-fi game or whatever, but Right now, we've got plans to do one for Zine Quest in February. Another. So who's thing. who's we? So my editor, Dave Cameron, he's a buddy of mine. He was actually my DM when we played in um, in the Bay Area. We lived together. He still lives there. Um, he didn't talk him into coming to Arkansas. Yeah, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> he's got dual citizenship in Scotland and here, so he's like, if it worse comes to worse, he's like, we're gonna plug it to the UK. So. But he's, uh, he's my editor, and he's going to be helping me. He's helped me kind of just keep me in check as far as, like, um, inconsistencies and sort of, like, game development, adventure editing, and spell checking. But in this next one, I'm going to have him step up a little bit, and he's going to take over uh, kind of adventure design and creation. I'll still be doing the design and the illustration kind of keeping it in the, in the same setting because everything kind of exists in the same greater setting but other than that he's kind of got free reign of what the next uh, adventure is going to be it'll be a higher le level adventure like five level five and up somewhere in there i think i've got some comments from backers that asked me if i was going to do something outside of the low level range which is what they really want to do is they want to take their map they want to run through the adventure characters level up then they put the next book up to that map and then they can start up at fourth level right yeah uh in none of the maps uh are that close together yeah. at least at least um manticore is nowhere near the other two uh scourge and silver axe are they're kind of in the same like country i would say but they're not that close i have a world map of where all this stuff exists but yeah we're still building on it eventually maybe we'll do like a campaign box set or something i don't know but we're having a lot of fun with this so there's no don't, we don't feel like we need to to stop yet so i end up i end up you know uh backing this uh the scourge uh without really reading much about it um it's like it's like it was it was it was it was a pretty easy sell um but my, my feeling was it sort of felt like a kind of a keep on the borderlands but with a little mm -hmm. bit more active rumblings politically totally and that was kind of what i was going for it's like the frontier area where it's butting up against the hostile you know hostile 
um, monsters, but this, the, the title Scourge of the Northland could be, you know, you could assume the humans are the scourge, you know, they're the ones invading the Northland too. So I've made it so that there will be um, reasons to sympathize with like other cultures that exist in this area and there'll be other factions within the, the city too. So I'm trying to give it so there's lots of choice for the DM and for the players, you know, they'll, they'll see, they'll have a lot presented to them and they can kind of interact however they want. Right. I think what's nice is, I mean, an option where it's like, you, you, you know, you don't necessarily predetermine, but you allow, you can allow for um, nuance. You know, some people don't want political nuance. They just want to just, they don't want to feel bad about their decisions. They just want to go <laughs> fight the, yeah, just, there's other people. It's like, you know what, you know, maybe I want to play the game where we, maybe we are the monster and, and, and maybe, you know, maybe I want to be subversive or, I mean, and that's all fun, but it's nice where you can present something in a way that it's probably not too difficult for a GM to, to, to turn a few knobs here uh, to make a slight yeah. adjustment to, cause it's already a lot of the, 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 the framework's kind of already in place where it can can be seen different ways totally and i and i i like that about you know the older modules too is you can kind of tack them on or they were meant to be tacked on to your own existing campaign even if you created the world you know i make, don't know like, i don't know really what they were <laughs> well this is also true they had, some of them were very strange um but uh but like i would always go back to um village of hamlet because i could I feel like I could incorporate that into, as long as it's a fantasy world, it could fit into most anything. Other ones are, yeah, there's some other that are um, a little weirder, harder to mesh. I think, man, because they were intended to be, uh, they were intended to be um, uh, game conventions. They did, uh, what's from yeah. for, not competitions, what I'm looking for. Different teams. Yeah. 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 Which is, which is interesting too, but. <laughs> No, I don't have much experiment experience, experience with that, which is like um, playing. I've played some at conventions, but I've never really done like a tournament. I don't even know what that looks like. I don't know, but it, it seems like that might be a challenge for, for one of your modules. Maybe, maybe you could. Yeah, make a tournament, <laughs> the modern tournament OSR module. <laughs> uh, who knows? Yeah. But uh, I, I backed yours as well, the um, Gary's Appendix. Yeah, you're, you're, you're the second person. Yeah, no, it's exciting. I, I like that idea. <clears throat> it's uh it is a um yeah, it's been I I don't know. Do you ever listen to the podcast? I haven't yet, but no, I'll have to Oh no, that's fine. No, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. I just didn't want to say something if you've already already heard it. Yeah. So it was it was definitely something I I kind of had the back burner. I was already gonna do the best area, but then I um I just it, kind of the like three weeks before the Kickstarter, I I I I did a hard pivot. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all did a little bit. We're like, wait a minute, there's Zine Quest happening this month? Yeah. yeah, I was like, I knew it was. I, I knew it. I knew it. Somewhere in Phil Reed said, hey, what are you guys doing? And I was thinking about doing the best here, but then it's like, I, what I really was wanting to do a while back was a zine. What I was really wanting to do was just no no art and just being a a bunch of articles. And um, that's rad, yeah. But so mm -hmm. what I'd like to do, and the, the thing is I've been, I, I reached, I sent out a call for help and I got a few, <laughs> I just, you know, strangers, hey, somebody want to write for this. And I actually got some people writing and it, it's worked out real good. So my goal is for the next one is also um, the, the keep the stable of people that have written. It's, it's all great stuff, but I want to like, go into more um i won't say academic i would like to like sprinkle some like maybe more even more academic kind of thoughts sure uh, or, or perusings and and uh and dial back the best area a bit because um it was originally a best area i decided to make into a zine but i i need to you know melt that out so yeah i like that idea um I, and i like a lot of your ideas stuff that i haven't heard is kind of interesting like your takes on uh heroic card i like that it's something i'm probably going to use i'm going to steal that <laughs> that's okay yeah i think that i think my players might get a kick out of that so because really uh ideas they really aren't anything until they come to action like mm -hmm. i can i can spell ideas all day long if i'm not doing it i mean it's just like there's no <laughs> you know what i'm saying so no feel free anything i spout 
and I think that's kind of the way I operate that it, I may not always, I, I'm always, I'm not say always, but a lot of times think or try to troubleshoot, but I'm not necessarily always great at execution either. So, but no, it's kind of really what it's all about. We're all, we're all learning from each other and trying to figure things out. And yeah, man, there's so many great resources out there and so many creative uh, DMs and creators out there that have great ideas. So what I would see, the thing is, what I really want is for you to say, yeah, I'm thinking about stealing that idea. What I really want is for you to take ideas and then put them to a publication. Then then I would have the luxury of being able to buy and be able to <laughs> implement and then be fully fleshed out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what I really want. Right. Yeah. That's a great, yeah, totally. Well, I so, need to play this, man. That sounds really cool. Yeah, I, the other thing I've been thinking about because somebody out there is going to do. It. Have you? Did you uh, purchase the Dune role playing game? No, I haven't. Looks cool though. Okay, so I'm not. Are you? Have you read Dune? I've read the first one. I have the next two sitting on my shelf, taunting me. And they're, they're, I, yeah, you're, it's okay. It, you're you're they're kind of worthwhile reading, but I don't. I don't. Yeah, I've read the first one twice. That book is amazing. And yeah, I've heard things about the next two, and then after that, it's kind of like, mm, you know, take it or leave it. So what's neat about the Dune RPG is they like they go back through all the books and the ones that I think his son wrote, and it goes way back in the past. And right. and I look at this whole thing they've done with the you know the Benny Gesserits and the the Mentats on, and it's like you could take this whole everything they've outlined file off serial numbers and, and turn this into a uh, uh, a science fantasy game mm -hmm. and set it into some sort of, you know, weird, you know, whatever. That's like, that's another thing I thought. It's, it's really kind of cool. There's, there's a structure there that would really set up, I think, for a pulp fantasy setting. That would be interesting. Yeah, for like a, a pulp, something that you could play. And, and yes and, and have more excitement i don't know what i don't know what the dune rpg would look like like do you have to you just take on the role of i'm assuming nobody's right no it's you're a part of a political i i i've not played it i've not read all the way through it um but the idea is that you you be different you can i believe be different members in the house and there are different activities that will occur and it's intended to be political in nature uh, okay and yeah. fighting nature complex. yeah but it's yeah, using the it. but the system is the, the, the i think they refine the system the um 2d20 so i think it's mm. it's not an overly complex system but it's it's right. definitely more geared towards um more geared less geared towards fighting you know that fighting is involved right is that um is it Palladium who did this one? No, Modiphius. Modiphius, okay. Yeah, because I knew that Palladium had their, their 2D20 system, and that was... That no, was I, Palladium did? Well, Palladium had a 2D20. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Like, I went back and I was reading uh, Robotech and Macross. They had, like, role-playing games, which were very combat-centric, um, really interesting mechanics. It was kind of like Traveler, and, like, you had de uh, defending actions, and you could roll versus an attack i don't know how that would look in, in practice it said it looked cool on the page when i was reading it but i don't know if like the game session would just go on forever in one single combat because nobody's taking damage <laughs> i feel like it would be a stalemate but it, it, and that's interesting because like in games where if you ever played like the hero system mm -mm. so armor there is uh armor there reduces damage and so if you're playing in a supers game it's really not a big deal. If you got a guy that his armor is so tough that energy weapons can't cut through him, it doesn't matter because they're susceptible to mental, they're susceptible to power drains, they're susceptible. But if you play the fancy version, as that armor class creeps up and the and the and the weapon damage, you know, it doesn't go real high. I mean, yeah, there's a point where all of a sudden, you know every point of armor now becomes like exponentially more more uh, useful mm -hmm. and you're right the, the problem is you you prolong combat yeah uh i don't know but 
I don't know what that would look like. You'd just be like, nope, the swing, you didn't do damage. It'd be like that for 10 rounds in a row. Like, there must be a way to run that. There must be a something that interacts with that. Yeah, I'm trying to think. But again, it's like, if you look at like, you know, D&D, especially, um, you know, if, if you only, if your chances aren't that great, of, I mean, you can roll D20s for a long time and not hit. Sure. Yeah. So there's no there's no sort of escalation of the dice. It just you just keep rolling. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's interesting. It is interesting how other um, systems handle that. In some games, like you said, like the Dune isn't very combat centric. It's more political. So not a lot hinges on. That. No. And I by. I imagine and again i haven't it'd be worth playing maybe I, do you go to any conventions i haven't in a long time but i i have passes now for gary con so i'm going to gary con next year which will be like my first like gaming convention because i go to like a lot of comic cons for you know selling my my art and stuff um, oh i didn't know that yeah so i'll do i do some comics and and I'll sell some of my zines there too. But now I'm going for as a player, going to play some convention, some convention RPGs. I'm looking forward to that. So, but I imagine at Gary Con, it's pretty much just D and D. I imagine. I don't know. I've not been to Gary Con. I go. I go to Game Hole Con, which is not. It's it's same region, mm. uh, but it's in October. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I've been to Gen Con and played some. I think we just played Five E back then. But I know they play a lot of games there, Gen Con. Yeah, it's it's definitely a bit much for me. Uh, I went, <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> I went like eight years ago. I'm like, <laughs> this is really cool, but wow, I'm a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> it is overwhelming, yeah. Well, I mean, the thing too is, did you have North Texas Con that's nearby you? Oh yeah, um, that's another one I had no idea existed, but then I saw. Um, the questing beast video where they were doing interviewing folks there so i'd love to go to that one too be, yeah no they probably love they probably love uh you running a game there too that'd be cool um i don't i don't think i'm the best dm but i i do like it so yeah, <laughs> yeah. i think i'm better i'm a better prepper than i am <laughs> yeah. uh but no that would be that'd be a good time i would like to check that out it's that's probably a drive i could make that without having to fly Yes, yeah, and I and I know with the game hole con, there's a lot of uh, a lot of zine creators there. That's cool, and so um, people sell, and so um, but yeah, it's uh, it's kind of, and you probably can find the same thing even at, at Gary Con is just connecting to other people. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to like meeting other creators out there. Are are you on the RPG Zine Facebook group? I'm not on any Facebook groups. No, I I I only use Facebook for Messenger. I've after two, 2016, I swore off Facebook for obvious reasons. Well, yeah, and you know, and I get it. Um, but boy, the RPG Zine group is a very very, and so is the OSC group. Is it really? I've heard that from the OSC group. Uh, it's and maybe I'll have to dip my toes back in there and check it out it's just every time i like i do that or somebody convinces me to sign up for something people that like that i haven't talked to in years come out of the woodwork and it's like i have no interest in talking to you you just have to set, set up a, a a separate moniker for your for yourself i must have to do that that might be what i need to do I, i'm <laughs> too honest i need a, a secret identity yeah i uh yeah yeah i've i've not had to do that i've but it's you know, I've survived Facebook mainly by muting a lot of people. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like, I really like you, but I just can't take it. Even if I agree with you, it's like, I still can't take this. I just don't mm -hmm. want to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. I'm fine with using it as a platform for, uh, you know, reaching other people in the hobby sphere. I think that's cool. It uh, It's definitely gelled for certain groups. Um, I think Twitter, I think... I think Twitter seems to be better for um, like finding odds and ends of people, mm -hmm. but I still haven't really figured it out. I'm not, I think I'm not, a, so I'm, I don't know if I'm just too old. 
I just not really figured out Twitter. I, I'm still trying to figure it out. It's it's fine, but yeah, I, I never know what's going to work and what what does work. It's baffling to me. Yeah, really. What am I? You know, I think part of it is there's some people I follow, and they they will share lots of different things, mm-hmm. and it's just little snippets of their life, and I think, well, that's fun. But I just really, I don't know. I have a hard time thinking that little snippets of my life are really, or, or, <laughs> right. or they, it's like, yeah. Um, I think um, one of my um, people I follow, Levi Combs. I think he's got it down to a science. I don't know what he has done, but he's got a massive following and he's wildly successful on social media. But mostly he's sharing like interesting stuff from like the hobby sphere or cult movies. And I feel like that's mostly what he shares and people just eat it up, you know? Well, yeah, because I'm, um, so yeah, just to be also, I think uh, Levi, because of moves, he's able to devote a fair amount of time to Mm -hmm. currently do this. Yeah. But by, yeah, but, but, but his connections are such that whenever he would, he would like a respond or do something, Twitter would send me a warning saying, this person has a lot of followers. Are you sure you're wanting them to? It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and, and, and then he did me the, a, a nice, nice turn where he just like spammed, uh, you know, like the self promotional ones with mm-hmm. Gary's uh, appendix. And, I was just astounded at the number. I don't know how he did it. Like, I don't know if he's got it organized somehow, but there must have been 30, you know, promote yourself Saturdays that he mm-hmm. shot me onto. Wow. And I was just like, my Twitter should go to ding, to ding, to ding. It's like, I, I, it's like, wow, that was a lot. Thank you, Levi. Then all of a sudden, ding, 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 ding. It's like 15 more. I'm like, it just never, it just, it didn't it was uh but yeah he's he's got the connections he's a great guy he's definitely a very i think what's also what i like about levi is he's also a very positive person so he's very yeah much and i think a, that comes out in his his social media posting too yeah and he's also at a lot of the conventions so if you were to go to north texas con and i imagine he's gonna be at gary con so i would if i were you i would definitely would seek him out. oh yeah oh absolutely he's definitely uh, on my list of people i want to hang out with yeah, pretty much I found about every zine creator, um, you know, has been wonderful to to to, to deal with. Mm-hmm. Let's deal with. <laughs> <laughs> so so what I've I've stated before, um, so like I've never talked to you before, right? We talked about maybe five minutes for the for the podcast sure. started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have found that. And I've never seen any video of you, audio of you, but I found that pretty much all of us in this kind of creative space, it, it, we all get along. It's like, there's something that we all tend to share. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, yeah, common appreciation for, you know, how silly all this is, but (laughs) (laughs) it it is kind of funny how it kind of hits me sometimes. Sometimes I very feel very confident about things and other times I'm like, wow, this is kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then when you step back and that's how life is all the time. So it, it really is. I think, I think what happens is not, now you're saying this. And I think also you've already done this before as an, as an illustrator, but I mean, the idea is that what we're doing is, is, is taking a risk. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of us either haven't got to that point or won't go to that point of taking a risk because it really is there's a lot of risk i never realized like to me and that has always been this way there's like the financial risk is one side but there's also people it's the social risk or the feeling of failure that people aren't willing to face Mm -hmm. yeah and that's and it's a shame i think you just have to you know like anything else exercise that muscle of trying and failing and then you know the blow or the uh the anguish of not <laughs> quite hitting the mark will that'll wear out and it won't it won't um sting so much you know you just have to keep going you have to keep uh trying especially in a creative field like this oh right and i think um and i think also if you 
commit to something what i find is like with a kickstarter you're making a very public declaration and you're putting yourself out in a way that's very um um your obligation is much greater mm -hmm. than sure. than just randomly throwing out pdf on you know itch right you know and i think that i think sometimes for a lot of people pinning yourself into a corner forces you to, to to step up yes and that's also a great learning experience yeah yeah and you get a lot of good feedback from from backers and from people who read your stuff and it's it's great you know you get beta readers built into your campaign you know. <laughs> but hopefully you deliver something that's you know worth worth their while well you know you know, mathematically speaking, your next Kickstarter should be a hundred thousand dollar or eighty thousand dollar Kickstarter. Right. I know. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so that you get that one out of the way, then one hundred and sixty. So how many more steps say you get to be a million dollars, and you can just right. uh... <laughs> you're right. Every time it doubles, <laughs> keep going. So uh, you know, the question is now is like, does that put? Does it feel good? Like, if you got your point, like, does it just boost your confidence? Or is it when you reach a certain level, then it's, is there a point where it becomes a little apprehensive too? Like, how does it, I've never reached that level. So you're. Um, I, I'd say it's probably a mixture of both. I definitely have to meet expectations where like, I, it, it has to be a quality product. You know, the first one didn't have to be a quality product. Right. Trying something. Um, and I guess the second one didn't necessarily either, but now that I've had two where people like it and it's been positively reviewed, like I have there, it, it's like, I've got to come to the table with something that's surpassing in quality of my last books, maybe not surpassing in page count, though I think this one will, I just have to step it up, you know, like you said, and I feel like the next one, like I'm stressing out a little bit about what, what it's going to be because it's good it's got to be really good <laughs> yeah, i don't know so what do you get you, you're talking about doing something sci-fi so what sort of thing would you do that sci-fi i don't know but i've i've read um mothership a couple times and i've backed a lot of other people other creators um, projects that they've designed for mothership and they all feel i guess a little bit different i just love that whole horror sci-fi genre like you know alien i don't know what i could bring that's new to the table and i don't know if there's any other systems out there that are quite as neat or popular but i like the idea of writing an adventure for some sort of sci-fi setting because i love the genre i love watching sci-fi movies just as much as i like watching fantasy movies you know or reading well Literature. yeah but joel hines i mean his stuff was quite a bit different and then there's another one where it's a space station and that one's not necessarily horror themed that's true i guess they don't all adhere to like the the main conceit of mothership but i think there is that kind of that feel of desperation is sort of common right and i feel like yeah the the risks are built into the mechanics where i'm not sure if that's the case or if that's been like omitted in other adventures but in some that I've read, like you can definitely lose your character in the session, which I feel like it's almost expected. Like it's almost like a fiasco or something. Like you're going to lose your character. <laughs> so somebody said I can't remember who I was interviewing. They said they were running a game, and they they thought they warned the players properly. And Nancy played a few sessions, and then and then like then they were going through this thing. He's like, are you really sure? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> and it just got wiped out. Then they're like done playing. It's like, <laughs> oh no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is why I want to try it out. I really want to see like how deadly it is. It sounds deadly on paper when I'm reading the rules. So I don't know. Yeah, I've never, I've never played Mothership. I never ran Mothership, but uh, it's definitely, I think with, a, especially the new system, that's, I think it was a new rule system coming out. For too long yeah. they they wrote they ran another kickstarter i think for like the the second edition i think it was the second edition or yeah i think it was um and i haven't picked that one up i still have the original scene yeah i just have the pdf i think the zine's actually not <laughs> like 15 bucks it's not really bad no it's not bad yeah i think i picked that up from exalted funeral i think it might be one of the first things i bought off of that website along with the uh uh, haunting of Ypsilon 14 little pamphlet that came with that. 
again, taunting me. I'll hopefully get a day, chance to run that. Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm not pushing for retirement, but I'm I'm just kind of have this fantasy that uh, <laughs> we all like have RVs and go to a park and stay there for a few weeks, and everybody runs a different game every. Amazing! Every it sounds absolutely <laughs> yeah, absolutely love that. Yeah, and the other thing I thought is like I don't know. You could probably do the same thing with cabins. Uh, do like a con, but instead just get a place where they'd have cabins and everything, and do it in an off season. Maybe you can get it cheap. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully not too off season where it's freezing. Yeah, exactly. You can't get there because it's there's uh, three feet of snow. <laughs> <laughs> the price is really good. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's got a sh snowshoe to get into it now. Wonderful. Well, I think we're getting close to hitting the time space continuum, Jacob. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate being on here. This has been great. Uh, we well, could probably go on for hours talking about other games and stuff that we want to try and run. But... Well, there's always next time. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have me on next time. Yeah. We'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, congratulations on your Kickstarter. Uh, amazing. Great work. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting a copy in the mail. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. You too.